Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part three, Light on the Way from Masonic Initiation by W. L. Wilmshurst. Chapter two, Light on the Way. They went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. First Kings 6, 8. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Will the day's journey take the whole long day from morn to night, my friend? But is there for the night a resting place, a roof for when the slow dark hours begin? May not the darkness hide it from my face? You cannot miss that in, Christina Rossetti. In the previous paper, we have spoken of the transition from darkness to light made by those who seek to effect the reconstitution of their natural being and to develop it by the science and methods of initiation to a higher and ultra-natural level. It has been made clear that that transition must necessarily be gradual and that though ceremonially dramatized in three degrees which can be taken in successive months, to realize the implications of those degrees in actual life experience may be a lifetime's work, perhaps more than a lifetime's. The apprentice who has entered himself to the business of rebuilding his own soul has much to learn and to do before he becomes even a competent craftsman in it. The craftsman in turn has much to do and far to journey before he can hope for complete mastership. The work of self-transmutation is a strenuous one, not suddenly or hurriedly to be performed, and one needing hours of refreshment and passivity as well as hours of active labor, to each of which he will find himself duly summoned at the proper time. There is much to be learned in regard to the secrets of his own nature and the principles of intellectual science, which only gradually and as the result of patience and experience can become revealed to his view. There is a superstructure to be raised, perfect in all its parts, a work involving much more than is at first supposed. There are tests and ordeals of a searching character to be undergone on the way. A measure of light, a first glimpse of the distant promised land may come to the eager sight of the properly prepared candidate from the first moment of his entrance upon the work. But he must not suppose that he has yet fully captured it and made it permanently his own. It is something, however, to have felt that a veil has been suddenly withdrawn from his previously darkened sight and that he has become able to distinguish between his former benightedness and the goal lying before him. We will entitle this present section, therefore, Light on the Way, and make it treat of a variety of matters calling for the aspirant's attention as he pursues the way that intervenes between his first glimpse of the light and its ultimate realization. And in a subsequent section, we shall speak of light in its fullness of attainment. We will supplement our previous explanation of Masonic doctrine by dealing with further symbols and passages in the rituals with which every Mason is familiar formally and by the outward ear but the significance of which too often passes unexplained and unobserved. The expositions in this section are offered not only for the private reflection of the members of the craft, but with the suggestion that they may serve thee as material for collective meditation by brethren in open lodge or at lodges of instruction. For those upon the path to real initiation, meditation is essential. For meditation opens a window in the mind through which light streams into the understanding from the higher spiritual principle in ourselves. Which window is symbolized by the dormer window in the emblematic temple of Solomon, through which came light to those ascending the stairway that wound inwardly to the middle chamber leading to the central sanctuary where alone light in its fullness was to be found. The practice of meditation, moreover, whether personal or collective, conduces to that quietness and control of the normally restless, wandering mind, which are indispensable for the apprehension of deep truth. Ancient lodges, we are told, were wont to meet on the highest hills and in the lowest valleys. And in an old instruction lecture, it is explained that those expressions are meant to be figurative and relate less to actual places than to the spiritual and mental condition of those assembled. To meet in the valley implied being in a state of sheltered passiveness and tranquility when the minds of the brethren surrendered themselves to quiet, collective thought on the subject of their work. And thus, being led beside still waters, they became like the limpid, unruffled surface of a lake, a clear, undistorting mirror for the reflection and apprehension of such rays of light and truth as might reach them from above. To meet on the high hills, on the other hand, implied the more active work of the lodge and the performance of it upon the superphysical plains, the hills of the spirit. 
for the real work of initiation is only there accomplished and is no longer a ceremonial formality. There are times for work and times for repose in the craftsman's task, times of labor and refreshment, and to perform that task efficiently, both must be utilized. Modern lodges in the general imperfect conception of masonry follow merely the rush and hustle methods of the outside world, which of course inside the lodge have no place and ought no longer to be emulated. They are busy enough on the active side, but they provide no opportunity for cultivating the equally necessary passive aspect of the work. It would be found eminently advantageous, therefore, if lodges which desire to realize true masonry adopted the practice of collectively contemplating points of symbolism and teaching, devoting certain meetings to this special purpose, and then, without more discussion than is necessary and helpful, quietly and earnestly concentrating attention upon the significance of some symbol or point of doctrine brought before them. For those seriously engaged in the ascent of the winding staircase, the following expositions may perhaps serve as helpful rays of light from the dormer window. They are necessarily brief and merely elementary introductions to phases of the science which, as the aspirant proceeds, he will find inexhaustible and claiming not cursory notice but his constant deep attention. May they, however, be as a lamp to his feet and a light upon the spiral path to his own middle chamber and help to guide him to that final central sanctuary where the light itself shines in fullness and waits to be found. 1. The Knowledge of Yourself It has already been shown that the structure and appointments of the Lodge are symbolic, that the Lodge is a representation both of the universe and of man himself as a microcosm or the universe in miniature that it is an image of his own complex constitution, his heavens and his earth, his spirituality and materiality, and all that therein is. By contemplating that image, therefore, the Mason learns to visualize himself. He is given a first lesson in that self-knowledge in the full attainment of which is promised the understanding of all things. Know thyself, we have said, was written over the portals of the ancient temples of initiation, self-knowledge being the aim of their intention and the goal of their purpose. Masonry perpetuates this maxim by recommending self-knowledge as the most interesting of all human studies. It is the tersest, wisest of instructions, yet little heeded nowadays, and it is incapable of fulfillment unless undertaken in accordance with the ancient science and with a concentration of one's whole energies upon the task. It involves the deepest introspection into one's self and perfect discrimination between what is real and permanent and what is unreal and evanescent in ourselves. As aspirants to the mysteries could not learn the secrets of the temple without entering it, learning its lessons, undergoing its disciplines and receiving its graduated initiations, so no one can attain self-knowledge save by entering into himself, distinguishing the false from the true, the unreal from the real, the base metal from the fine gold, sublimating the former into the latter, and ignoring what is negligible or superfluous. The very word initiation primarily derives from the Latin in ire, to go within, and thence, after learning the lessons of self-analysis to make a new beginning, initium, by reconstructing one's knowledge of life and manner of living. The 43rd Psalm restates the same instruction. Intro ibo ad altare dei, I will go into the divine altar, Similarly, the Masonic initiation contemplates a going within oneself until one reaches the altar or center, the divine principle or ultimate hidden basis of our being. To know the anatomy and physiology of the mortal body is not self-knowledge. The physical fabric of man is a perishing self, mere dust and shadow projected from vitalizing forces within it and without permanence or reality. To understand the nature and mechanism of the mind, emotions and desires is useful and necessary but is not self-knowledge, for they too are transient and therefore unreal aspects of the deeper real self. The personality we present to the world is not our real self. It is but a mask, a distorting veil, behind which the true self abides hiddenly and often unknown to our unreal surface self unless and until it be brought forward into consciousness, displacing and overriding the notions and tendencies of the natural but benighted superficial self. Until then, its light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. To bring it forward out of its veils of darkness, to comprehend and establish it permanently in our awareness is, and has ever been, the purpose of all initiation. 
but this cannot be achieved until the outer bodily and mental vestures have been purified and a voluntary dying or effacement of everything in us alien to or conflicting with the real self has been suffered. All which is implied by the teaching of our three degrees respectively. True self-knowledge is unobstructed conscious union of the human spirit with God and the realization of their identity. In that identic union, the unreal superficial selves have become obliterated. The sense of personality is lost, merged in the impersonal and universal. The little ego is assumed into the great all and knows as it knows. Man realizes his own inherent ultimate divinity and thenceforth lives and acts no longer as a separate individual with an independent will, but in integration with the divine life and will, whose instrument he becomes, whose purposes he thenceforth serves. This is the great day of atonement, when the limited personal consciousness becomes identified or made at one with one's own divine, omniscient, vital and immortal principle, which each must realize as the high priest of his personal temple and after many washings and purifyings against the contrary tendencies of his former unregenerate nature. This was the secret supreme attainment hinted at in the cryptic maxim, know thyself, each of us may judge for himself whether he has yet reached it. To find our own center, our real self involves therefore a turning inwards of our previously externalized faculties of sense and thought and an introspective penetration of the outlying circumferential elements of our nature until the center is found. This task is figured by our ceremonial perambulations and by the path of the winding staircase leading from the anterooms and forecourts of our nature to the center up which the aspirant must ascend, asking, seeking, knocking all the way, being subjected from time to time to tests of his progress and receiving without scruple or diffidence such wages of good fortune or adversity as unseen providences may know to be his due, the inmost sanctuary he will find closely guarded. Nothing unclean can enter or approach that holy place. Hence, in the biblical description of the symbolic temple, one finds that in the forecourt, stood the great laver of water for the cleansing of pollutions and the altar of fire for the sacrificial burning up of one's impurities. The sword of the inner guard, directed to those unqualified to enter the lodge, is the Masonic way of inculcating that peril exists to those who are not properly prepared to approach the center or who would rush in where angels fear to tread. It corresponds with the sword of the cherubim in Genesis, which turned every way to keep the way to the tree of life from the approaches of the unfit. Mental as well as physical purity is indispensable to real initiation, but is far more difficult of the two to acquire. Modern psychology discloses not only how fractional a part of our entire mentality functions above the threshold of our normal awareness, but also what knots and twists, what mental lumber, what latent horrors and accumulations of inner foulness lie stored in the subconsciousness of even those living ordinarily clean lives. They are the deposits of the mind's past activities, forgotten often by the conscious mind itself, yet automatically registered upon our impalpable mind stuff by the recording pencil, mentioned among the third degree working tools, which at every moment of our lives posts up entries of our thoughts, words and actions. For at the center of ourselves is the all observant I, so that we ourselves constitute our own judgment book, wherein each of us unwittingly inscribes his own history and formulates his own destiny, and its pages we have each to read ourselves. With these mental deposits and consolidations, those skilled in initiation science are well familiar. The modern psychologist calls them complexes. In the old treatises on the subject, they are termed foul ethers, congelations of impure mental matter. They are the base metals of masonry, each of us has been an artificer of those metals and worked them into all manners of grotesque designs in his mental nature and hence the conferment upon the candidate at a certain stage of a name attributed to the first of such artificers and signifying him to be still incompletely purged of worldly possessions of this kind. These base metals require to be discharged from the system by a long process of corrective purifying thought and aspiration and to be transmuted into gold or pure mind stuff before real initiation is possible. No inward fog must intervene between the outer and innermost organs of consciousness when the time comes for these to be unified. The light of truth cannot penetrate a mind crammed with pernicious thought and with opinions to which it clings tenaciously. It must empty itself of all pre-acquired knowledge and prejudices and then rise on the wings of its own genius 
into the realm of independent thought, and they learn truth at first hand by directly beholding it. The incident of attaining light and self-knowledge is dramatically emphasized in Masonic ceremonial. It is represented by that important moment in the ritual of the third degree, when darkness suddenly gives way to bewildering light, in which light the candidate gazes back for the first time upon the remains of his own past and beholds the emblems of his own mortality. He has now, at least in ceremony, surmounted the great transitional crisis involved in becoming raised from a natural to a higher order of humanity. He perceives his temporal organism to have been the tomb of transformation in which the great change has been wrought. He has risen from that tomb, and for him the old grave of the natural body has lost its sting, and that spiritual unconsciousness which is termed death has been swallowed up in the victory won at last by his higher eternal principle over his lower temporal one. The mystical sprig of acacia has bloomed at the head of his grave by the efflorescence of the vital and immortal principle in his purified mind and neural system. Thus is portrayed for us in Masonic ceremony the moment of attainment of knowledge of one's true self. The incident, let it be emphasized, does not involve the physical death of the body and its faculties, for to the companions of his former toils, the purified mind will thereafter be reunited. But thenceforth they will be his docile, plastic, obedient servants and no longer his master. He will continue to live in the world for the remainder of his appointed span, no longer for his own sake, but for the uplifting and advancement of his fellow men to his own high degree, his expansion of consciousness and wisdom will become part of his equipment for practical work in the world. His own spiritual evolution is complete so far as the educative experience of this world can take it. He lives now to help on that of humanity. A great and good brother reviewing his long connection with Masonic sanctuaries more than a century ago wrote thus about initiation. The only initiation which I preach and seek with all the ardor of my soul is that by which we may enter into the heart of God and make God's heart enter into us, there to form an indissoluble marriage which will make us the friend, brother, and spouse of our divine Redeemer. Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, Theosophic Correspondence with Baron Kirchberger, a work of great value and disclosing the nature of Masonic work in French lodges prior to the revolution of 1789. This attainment is the self-knowledge pointed to by the craft teaching and to which that teaching seeks to guide the reflections of every Masonic initiation has no other end than this conscious union between the individual soul and the universal divine spirit. This union is symbolized by the familiar conjunction of the square and the compasses. The square is the emblem of the soul, the compasses of the spirit which indwells in that soul. At first the mason sees the points of the compasses concealed behind the square and, as he progresses, their points emerge from that concealment until both become superimposed upon the square. Thus is indicated the progressive subordination of the soul and the corresponding coming forward of the ultimate spirit into personal consciousness so that the mason can work with both those points, thus becoming an efficient builder in the spirit and rendering the circle of his own being complete by attaining conscious alliance with his ultimate and only true self. 2. The G. Centrally in the ceiling of each lodge is exhibited this striking symbol. It is the emblem of the divine presence in the lodge. It is also the emblem of that presence at the spiritual center of the individual mason. Its correspondence in the Christian church is the perpetual light burning before the high altar. In the first and second craft degrees, the symbol is visible in the heavens of Lodge. In the third degree, it has become invisible, but its presence is still manifested, being reflected in the small light in the east, which in correspondence with the divine presence is as every mason knows inextinguishable, even in one's darkest moments. In the royal arch degree, it again becomes visible, but in another form and in another position on the floor of the temple and at its center, and in the form of a cubical altar, a white stone bearing the sacred name. In the course of the degrees, therefore, it has come down from heaven to earth. Spirit has descended to the plane of purified matter. The divine and the human have been brought together and made one. God has become man. Man has been unified with God and has found the divine name written upon the altar of his own heart. In the significance of this symbol and its transpositions during the four degrees may therefore 
be discerned the whole purpose and end of initiation, the union of the personal soul with its divine principle. Masonry has no other objective than this. All other matters of interest connected with it are but details subsidiary to this supreme achievement. When the lodge is opened, the mind and heart of every brother composing it should be deemed as also being opened to the G and all that it implies, to the intent that those implications may eventually become realized facts of experience. When the lodge is closed, the memory of the G symbol and its implications should be the chief one to be retained and pondered over in the repository of the heart. Further, great significance lies in the centrality of the G. The lodge is grouped around it, not assembled immediately below it. It is as though this blazing star or glory in the center burned with too fierce a light for anything less pure and bright than itself to withstand the descent of its direct rays. And accordingly, the floor of the lodge is left open and unoccupied, and only at its extremities do the assembled brethren sit removed from its direct rays. Directly beneath it lies the checkerwork floor. The symbol of the manifested creation where the one white light from above becomes differentiated into perpetual duality and opposites of light and darkness, good and evil, positive and negative, male and female, as evidenced by the black and white squares. Yet the whole held together in a unity as is denoted by the symbolic skirt work around the same. The G therefore denotes the universal spirit of God permeating and unifying all things. It is a substitute for the Hebrew letter Yod, the tenth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and out of which all the other letters of that alphabet are constructed in correspondence with the truth that all created things are modifications of the one primal spirit. In the instruction lecture of a degree outside our present constitutions, the G is explained as having a threefold reference. One, the glory of God or glory in the center. Two, grandeur or the greatness of perfection to which man may become raised by initiation into union with God at his center. Three, Gomel, a Hebrew word of praise for the divine power and goodness in designing that perfection and that union between the creator and the creature. There is also a Hebrew tradition that Gomel was the word uttered by Adam on first beholding the beauty of Eve and perceiving the ultimate destiny of humanity. The G had its equivalent in the Egyptian mysteries in the solar symbol of Ra, the spiritual sun. In the great temple of the Greek mysteries at Delphi, where the Eleusinian initiations took place for 17 centuries, it was represented by the fifth letters of the Greek alphabet, the E or Eta, five being a numerical symbol of man in the Pythagorean system, as evidenced by his five senses, the fivefold extension of his hands and feet, and in accordance with considerations of a more abstruse nature. Hence the five-pointed star or pentagram is also a symbol of man and expresses a variety of truths concerning him. In the rituals in the Book of the Dead, the candidate is described as a keeper of five. Operative fellow craft masons worked in batches of five and a speculative fellow craft lodge today consists of five brethren. All these allusions having a deeper significance than can be explained here, but bearing upon the present state of human evolutional development. Plutarch records that the E was regarded as a symbol of the greatest importance and instructiveness and was exhibited in three forms, corresponding with our three degrees. First in wood, afterwards in bronze, and finally in gold. The progression signified a corresponding advance of the candidate's moral and spiritual nature under the discipline of initiation. He is likened at first to soft, perishable wood, hardening into the durability of bronze, which impure alloyed metal finally becomes sublimated into gold, the symbol of the attainment of purity, wisdom and perfection to which initiation leads. Beyond this, however, the central symbol had another deep meaning. The great initiation temples of antiquity, as also certain Christian churches of historic interest, such as those of Iona and Glastonbury, from which Britain became Christianized, were erected at certain focal points of the Earth's surface known to the initiates of the time as being magnetic centers or nodal points of spiritual force peculiarly favorable for the influx into this world of currents of divine power and for their irradiation thence to surrounding regions. Each such place was called an omphalos, a naval or mystical center and the temple at Delphi is related to have been built where it was under divine guidance and for that purpose. And we know that it became the center of light and religion 
to the then civilized Western world for 17 centuries. This historical fact and this occult principle are now reproduced in masonry. Every lodge, every place of initiation is in theory, though not nowadays in practice, held at a center or physical focus point selected as being favorable both to the initiation of those who enter it and to the spiritual advancement of the uninitiated popular world resident in its vicinity. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. A temple or lodge of brethren intelligently performing its work is not only engaged in a work of spiritual building as regards its own members, it is though perhaps unconsciously at the same time generating and throwing off vibrations of spiritual energy to all around it. Its occult influence extends and its radiations are of efficacy to a greater range than one dreams of. If then the lodge be a spiritual focus point, the center of the lodge where the G is exhibited is its most vital and sacred point, the point at which divine energy may be thought of as concentrated and specially powerful and the reason will become clear for placing the candidate at that point at a certain moment in the ceremony. Why is he then placed in the center? Previously, he has been placed not there, but in certain more removed places in the lodge, in the northeast or the southeast corners, where the intensity of the central light is theoretically less powerful, where it is tempered and adjusted to his as yet unperfected organism, and where charges and instruction appropriate to his then state of advancement are imparted to him. But when directed to be placed in the lodge center, he is called upon to stand, as it were, in direct alignment with the descending ray of the supernal light and to bear the stress of its full current. The intensity of that current can only be borne and withstood by one who is perfect in all his parts and in whom the sensual, emotional, and mental natures have been purified, rectified, and brought into harmony and to an alignment corresponding with the physical and moral erectness of a just and upright man. An unpurified man would run the peril of having his organism injured or shattered by a current of that fiery power, by which every soul must sooner or later be tested, but which consumes everything not assimilable with itself. The three Hebrew children, that is, initiates, who withstood unscathed the fiery furnace into which they were plunged typify the truth here testified to. When, therefore, a candidate is placed in the center of the lodge beneath the G symbol, let those assembled around him try to realize the intention of what is thereby implied. Let them reflect that at that important moment, more perhaps than at any other in the ceremonies, it is possible for the celestial light to descend upon the duly prepared candidate, to flood his heart and expand his mind, and so to open his understanding to the instruction then communicated to him that he may realize the spirit as well as hear the letter of it while standing in that sacred position. And let them at that moment silently and earnestly invoke the light of the center, that it may then consciously arise in both him and them so that what is done ceremonially may become for them both a great fact of spiritual experience. The point is emphasized here with earnestness because the Masonic procedure of placing the candidate in the center of the lodge at an important stage of his progress not only perpetuates a traditional and purposeful ancient practice, but also accords with what occurs in initiations of a much more advanced and real character than it is possible to speak of here, as those who become duly qualified will one day come to find. By understanding and being faithful in the small things of even an elementary and ceremonial system, one becomes educated for and prepared to be entrusted with greater ones when the time for acquiring them arrives. 3. The Ladder A most important part of the curriculum of the ancient mysteries was instruction in cosmology, the science of the universe. The intention of that instruction was to disclose to candidates the physical and metaphysical constitution of the world and the place and destiny of man in it. They were shown how the complex human organism reproduces the great world and summarizes it in small so that man may see himself to be a microcosm or miniature copy of it. They were enlightened not only upon the external visible aspect but also upon the physically unseen and impalpable aspect both of the universe and themselves. They learned truths concerning the material and the ultra-material sides of the world and were taught that corresponding features were present in themselves. They learned of the continual flux of matter, of the transiency of bodily forms, 
and of the abiding permanence of the one life or spirit which has descended and embodied itself in matter and has there distributed and clothed itself in an endless but progressive variety of forms from the mineral up to the human with the purpose of generating eventually a finished perfected product as the result of the mighty process. There was demonstrated to them the dual cosmic method of involution and evolution by which the universally diffused life force involves and circumscribes itself within material limitations and physical conditions and thence evolves and arises out of them enriched by the experience. They were taught of the different levels and graduations of the universe some of them material and some ethereal, the planes and subplanes of it, upon which the great scheme is being carried out, which levels and planes, all progressively linked together, constitute, as it were, one vast ladder of many rounds, staves or rungs, a ladder which Tennyson once well described as the world's great altar stairs, which slope through darkness up to God. Candidates in the old systems were instructed in these matters before being admitted to initiation. The knowledge served to explain to them their own nature and constitution and their place in the world system. It demonstrated to them their own evolutionary possibilities and made clear to them why initiation science had been instituted and how initiation itself was an intensive means of accelerating the spiritual evolution of individuals who were ripe for it and capable of intelligently cooperating with and expediting the cosmic process. With this knowledge they were then free either to proceed to actual initiation and undertake its obligations, sacrifices and discipline, or to stand down and go no farther if they found themselves unwilling or without the courage to undertake the arduous task involved. Freedom of the personal will in this momentous choice was always essential to admission to initiation, and the same absence of constraint still attaches to admission to modern masonry. The modern mason, however, is left entirely without any cosmologic instruction and to such hazy notions on the subject as he may happen to hold. It becomes difficult, therefore, in regard to this and many other matters of Masonic moment, to speak of the disciplina arcani to those who may be either not interested in it or who would treat the information with incredulity as something about which nothing certain is known or perhaps knowable. Skepticism, freedom and independence of thought about matters of a more or less occult nature have their undoubted place and value in the outer ways of the world. But they are foreign to and inconsistent with the mental attitude appropriate to those who, on entering a hall of initiation, are supposed to tile the door to the outside world and its conceptions and divesting themselves of all ideas they pre-acquired to offer themselves as humble, teachable pupils of a new and authoritative order of knowledge where everyone claims to be already possessed of a sufficiently satisfactory explanation of the universe and his place in it, or is content to get along without one, and in either case prefers his private judgment to any other that may be offered him, the soil for making initiates, in any real sense, is distinctly unfavorable. For such, however, these pages are not written, they are offered only to the minority of brethren eager to learn what masonry has to teach them upon matters in which they earnestly seek knowledge and guidance. Masonry, then, in exhibiting to them a simple ladder offers them a symbol the significance of which is calculated to open widely the eyes of their imagination. It is true that in the instruction lecture the ladder is expressly referred to that of Jacob in the familiar biblical episode and that that ladder is then given a moral significance and made to suggest the way by which man may ascend from earth to heaven by climbing its symbolic rungs and especially by utilizing its three chief ones representing the virtues faith, hope, and charity. This moral interpretation is warranted and salutary, but it is far from exhaustive and conceals rather than reveals what Jacob's ladder was really intended to convey to the perspicuous when the compilers of our system gave it the prominence they did. We may be assured they had a much deeper purpose than merely reminding us of the Pauline triad of theological virtues. The latter, then, covertly emphasizes the old cosmological teaching before referred to. It is a symbol of the universe and of its succession of step-like planes reaching from the heights to the depths. It is written elsewhere that the Father's house has many mansions, many levels and resting places for his creatures in their different conditions and degrees of progress. It is these levels, these planes and subplanes, that are denoted by the rungs and staves of the ladder. And of these there are, for us in our present state of evolutionary unfoldment, three principal ones. The physical plane, 
the plane of desire and emotion, and the mental plane, or that of the abstract intelligence which links up to the still higher plane of the spirit. These three levels of the world are reproduced in man. The first corresponds with his material physique, his sense body, the second with his desire and emotional nature, which is a mixed element resulting from the interaction of his physical senses and his ultra-physical mind. The third with his mentality, which is still farther removed from his physical nature and forms the link between the latter and his spiritual being. The ladder and its three principal staves may be seen everywhere in nature. It appears in the septenary scale of musical sound with its three dominants, in the prismatic scale of light with its three primary colors, in our seven-day scale of weekly time, in the septenary physiological changes of our bodily organism, and the similar periodicities known to physics and indeed to every branch of science. The Perfect Lodge has seven members, including three principal officers. The advancement of the third degree candidate to the East is by seven steps. The first three of which, it will be remembered, are given special significance. Thus, the universe and man himself are constructed ladder-wise in an orderly organized sequence of steps. The one universal substance composing the differentiated parts of the universe descends from a state of the utmost ethereality by successive steps of increasing densification until gross materialization is reached, and thence ascends through a similarly ordered gradation of planes to its original place, but enriched by the experience gained by its activities during the process. It was this cosmic process which was the subject of the dream or vision of Jacob, and which accounts for Jacob's ladder being given prominence in our symbolism. What was dreamed or beheld by him with supersensual vision is equally perceptible today by anyone whose inner eyes have been opened. Every real initiate is one who has attained an expansion of consciousness and faculty enabling him to behold the ethereal worlds revealed to the Hebrew patriarch as easily as the uninitiated man beholds the phenomenal world with his outer eyes. The initiate is able to see the angels of God ascending and descending. That is, he can directly behold the great stairway of the universe and watch the intricate but orderly mechanism of involution, differentiation, evolution and resynthesis constituting the life process. He can witness the descent of human essences or souls through planes of increasing density and decreasing vibratory rate, gathering around them as they come veils of matter from each until finally this lowest level of complete materialization is reached, where the great struggle for supremacy between the inner and the outer man, between the spirit and the flesh, between the real self and the unreal selves and veils built round it, has to be fought out on the checkerwork floor of our present existence, among the black and white opposites of good and evil, light and darkness, prosperity and adversity and he can watch the upward return of those who conquer in the strife and attaining their regeneration and casting off or transmuting the worldly possessions acquired during their descent, ascend to their source, pure and unpolluted from the stains of this imperfect world. But to no man comes such vision as this unless he too be a Jacob who flees from the clash and hurley of secular activities into the solitude of his own soul and in that barren wilderness interrogates himself and struggles agonizingly to penetrate the mystery of his existence, to read its purpose and tear out the last secret of his own being. So perchance he may fall asleep, his head at last quietly pillowed upon that hard stone against which hitherto he has been blindly dashing it. And then by the surrender of his own will and mental activities and in the silence and quietude of the senses, his own inmost great light may break and from that newfound center he will see and know and find the answer to all his needs. For in the words of an ancient record of initiation, the sleep of the body becomes the awaking of the soul and the closing of the eyes true vision, and silence becomes impregnated with God. This happened to me when I received the supreme authentic word. I became God-inspired. I arrived at truth. Wherefore I give from my soul and whole strength blessing to the Father, Jacob's vision and ladder therefore exemplify the attainment of initiation, the expansion of consciousness that comes when the light of the center is found and the cosmic vision that then becomes possible. The same truth is taught in a little treatise of great instructiveness to every Mason, 
written by the initiate philosopher Porphyry in the third century and entitled On the Cave of the Nymphs. It is an exposition of a passage in Homer's Odyssey, which he shows likewise to be a veiled story of the soul's wanderings, of its crossing the rough seas of life and enduring the tempests and trials of this world and finally perfecting itself and escaping into the haven of peace. The passage describes a certain dark cave above which grew an olive tree and into which certain nymphs entered at one end and became busy in weaving purple garments for themselves and it was not possible to leave the cave save by a gate at the other end and after having ceased to be satisfied with the pleasure of inhabiting that agreeable but benighted place and sought a way of escape. Porphyry thus explains the allegory. The dark cave is that of the body into which the soul, a nymph or spiritual being, enters and weaves around itself a garment of flesh and blood and indulges in sense gratification alien to its real nature. The nymph soul has descended through the plains of the cosmos until it has entered this cave by the gate of man, that is by evolving to human status, and it can only leave it by passing out through the opposite gate, the gate of the gods, that is by becoming perfected and divinized. This it cannot do save with the help of oil from the olive planted at the top of the cavern the oil of wisdom which shall initiate the soul and guide it to the way out, to the higher worlds and the regions of the blessed. Porphyry's exposition continues thus. In this cave, therefore, says Homer, all external worldly possessions must be deposited. Here, naked and as a suppliant, afflicted in body, casting aside everything superfluous and renouncing all sensual energies, one must sit at the foot of the olive and consult with Minerva, wisdom by what means we may effectually destroy that hostile rote of passions which lurk insidiously in the secret recesses of the soul. It will not be a simple task to become liberated from this sensible life, but he who dares to do this must transmute himself so that being at length divested of the torn garments by which his true self is concealed, he may recover the ruined empire of his soul. The mason who reads this parable will not fail to see in it the allusion to the preparation of candidates. For initiation, or to recognize that the cave and the olive tree growing above it correspond precisely with the grave of Hiram Abiff and the sprig of acacia planted at its head. Both of these allude, of course, to the human body in which the true spiritual self of man lies buried and imprisoned and from the bondage of which it can only be freed by cultivating and lighting the oil of wisdom or alternatively of causing the sprig of acacia to blossom, which will enlarge his consciousness and reveal to him his path through the universe. We have each descended into this world by the steps of Jacob's ladder. We have each to ascend from it by the same steps. In some Masonic diagrams and tracing boards, upon the ladder is exhibited a small cross in a tilted, unstable position, as if ascending it, that cross represents all who are engaged in mounting the ladder to the heights and who rise by stepping stones from their dead selves to higher things. Each carries his cross, his own cruciform body, as he ascends. The material vesture whose tendencies are ever at cross purposes with the desire of his spirit and militate against the ascent. Thus weighted, each must climb and climb alone Yet reaching out as the secret tradition teaches and the arms of the tilted cross signify one hand to invisible helpers above and the other to assist the ascent of feebler brethren below. For as the sides and separate rungs of the ladder constitute a unity, so all life and all lives are fundamentally one and none lives to himself alone. Indeed, life and the ladder it climbs are one and indissociable, the summit of both reaches to and disappears out of Ken into the heavens. The base of both rests upon the earth. But these two terminals, that of spirit and that of matter, are but opposite poles of a single reality, which cannot be known as a unity or otherwise than in its differentiated aspects of many planes, many mansions, many rounds or staves, except by him who has unified them in himself and become able to ascend and descend upon the ladder at will. But this is the privilege only of the initiate skilled in that science of life which teaches how to mount the Scala Perfectionis, as a famous classical work of the 15th century terms the Ladder of Initiation, known to Masons under the glyph of Jacob's Ladder. 4. The Superstructure 
The novitiate Mason is taught to regard his normal natural personality as but a foundation stone upon which he is recommended to erect a superstructure, perfect in all its parts and honorable to the builder. To how many does this instruction mean anything more than a general pious counsel to become merely a man of strong moral character and virtue? It is something, of course, to fulfill that elementary standard, which needs, however, no membership of a secret order for its accomplishment. But the recommendation implies a very different meaning from that, as a little reflection will show. It is not a recommendation merely to improve the condition of the already existing foundation stone, the personality, but to erect upon that foundation something which, which previously did not exist, something which will transcend and outrange it, although built upon it. For the reader who is unversed in the deeper side of Masonic significance and is unaware of the hidden nature of it as thoroughly known to the original exponents of the science, the subject may prove difficult. It must therefore be explained at the outset that the superstructure to be erected is the organization of an ethereal or spiritual body in which the skilled Mason can function in independence of his physical body and natural personality. The theory of Masonry presupposes that man is a fallen creature that his natural personality is a transient and unreal expression of his true self as conceived in the divine mind, and that under appropriate tuition and self-discipline, he may become rebuilt and reorganized into the original condition from which he has fallen. The present natural personality, however, is the basis or foundation stone out of which that reorganization can proceed, and within it already exists, though in a condition of chaos and disorder, all the material requisite to the purpose. Building a superstructure upon one's present self involves much more than merely improving one's moral character. It is not a novice's task, although the advice to perform it is rightly given in the apprentice stage. It is a work of occult science, only to be undertaken by those educated and skilled in that science. It is the science to which the Christian master referred in the words, which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold begin to mock, saying, this man began to build but was not able to finish. Accordingly, the mason desirous of building a tower or superstructure should sit down first and count the cost, by acquiring a thorough understanding of what is involved. And before he is able even to begin the erection of such a building, he will find a good deal of rough laborer's work as first to be done upon himself in clearing the ground for the intended structure. There is an old Masonic degree, not comprised in our present constitutions, devoted specially to this subject. It is called the degree of Grand Architect and throws great light on the intention of those who, well understanding the secret science, made reference in our ritual to the building of a superstructure. In that degree, the reference is to building structures in the air, and it is taught that this is the work only of grand architects, being too great for inferior craftsmen who only know by admiring them at a distance when done. Structures in the air. All structures, save subterranean ones, rise into the air, the average reader will say. Yet not buildings of brick or stone are here meant. Again, building castles in the air is a familiar term for indulgence in daydreaming and fanciful speculation. But whilst all thought energy is constructive and creates objective form upon the plane of mind, we may be assured that the sages who perpetuated Masonic science were innocent of recommending the practice of anything so futile and unpractical. The airy structure to which they allude is the formation of a super-physical ethereal body, a body of mist, as Hesiod and other Greek classics describe it, in which the adept Mason may consciously function in the finer planes of life and apart from his gross physical organism and in which he will continue to live when the latter has become permanently discarded. It is spoken of by Origen, the Christian father of the second century, as follows. Another body, a spiritual and ethereal one, is promised us, a body not subject to physical touch, nor seen by physical eyes, nor burdened with weight, and which shall be metamorphosed according to the different regions in which it shall be. In that spiritual body, the whole of it will be an eye, the whole of it an ear, the whole serve as hands, the whole as feet, implying that all the now distributed faculties will be unified in that body into one, as was the case with man before the fall, 
and descent into matter and multiplicity. Let us justify these observations by some pertinent references to the subject in the great textbook of initiation science, the volume of the sacred law, though they might be abundantly supplemented from other sources. Like the famous Orphic hymns of the Pythagorean and Eleusinian schools of the mysteries, the Psalms of our Bible are an anthology of hymns of the Hebrew initiates and are full of Masonic illusion and instructiveness. In the 48th Psalm, the disciple of spiritual science is directed to take a walk round the symbolic city of Jerusalem. He was told to mark well its bulwarks, to observe its palaces, and particularly to pay attention to the great tower of the temple, which, like a modern cathedral spire, rose into the air above all other buildings, so that he might not only himself appreciate the symbolism of what he saw, but might be in a position to interpret its significance to them that come after, that is, to junior students of the science. He thus received a striking object lesson in the analogy of material buildings to spiritual ones. In the massive defensive walls of the city, he was to recognize the strength, permanence, and resisting power of the spiritual organism or holy city which he must build for himself in exchange for, but upon the foundation of the frail, perishable, temporal body. In the palaces of the mighty, with their gorgeous interiors and stores of costly furnishings and precious objects of art, he was to perceive that his own interior must become correspondingly beautified and enriched with spiritual treasures. But in the great heaven-pointing tower, to which his attention was specially directed, he was to see the symbol of a structure as far transcending his present temporal organism as the temple spire outranged the adjacent buildings at its feet. From this, he was to deduce the necessity of building and projecting upwards from his lower organization a tower, a superior spiritual body, rising into and capable of functioning in the air or more tenuous and ethereal worlds than this physical one. This is the structure in the air, which only grand architects are competent to raise. This is the superstructure which our entered apprentices are enjoined to aspire to building. Let us turn next to the further pertinent information on the subject given by the Apostle Initiate to his Corinthian pupils. He instructs them on this subject of superstructures. How is it possible to rear them? How are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? He is not speaking of the physically defunct, but of that condition of atrophied spiritual consciousness characterizing the normal animal man, which is always described as a state of death in the biblical and other writings on the subject. He proceeds to explain that the physical body itself cannot be raised since corruption cannot inherit incorruption, but that nevertheless there can be a resurrection from the dead through a sublimation of its vital essences, which can be reorganized and reconstituted into a new body of subtle matter on a supraphysical level. First comes the natural body we all wear to begin with, but out of it can be evolved a psychical body. The former is an entirely earthy vesture exhibiting an illusory, unreal self to the world. The latter is the body of our true spiritual self or Lord from heaven which hitherto has remained masked and buried within that temporal vesture, sown in it as a seed, but capable of bursting its sheath and being raised from its former impotence to power, activity and conscious function. He properly speaks of it as one of the secrets and mysteries of initiation, and his familiar words may thus be paraphrased. I'm expounding to you a mystery, one of the arcana of initiation. We are not designed to remain always asleep in this drugged, deadened state of consciousness in which we are plunged, where we suffer the illusion that we are really alive, but are not. In the course of our evolution, the due time comes for each of us to awake out of that sleep and to become changed, transmuted, for our consciousness to be transposed to a higher level. We have borne the earthly human image. We have now to exchange it for an ethereal one of finer texture and purer quality. The change, the transposition of consciousness from the old to the new center comes suddenly, though it may take long to prepare and purify ourselves for its coming. When it occurs, it comes with an inwardly heard crash, like a trumpet blast, as the nervous system and brain structures react to the stress upon them involved in the transition. It must be explained that the trumpet and last trumpet are technical terms among initiates for the spiral trumpet-shaped whirls or vortices occurring in subtle matter under stresses 
audible to those in whom the change occurs. The reference to the sound of the last trumpet stands for a physiological experience as the last fine physical strands of the old nature are, as it were, snapped and the nervous system re-electrified. In the East, this experience is called the end of the world, since for the initiate it means the termination of his old worldly consciousness and its replacement by one of a much more vivid and intense quality. The Apostle further explains that for this newly evolved ego or conscious center, there is an appropriate body, for there are celestial as well as terrestrial bodies. There cannot be consciousness apart from a formal vehicle for it, and as the old earthy body has served and will so continue to serve for ordinary mundane purposes, so will the newly evolved consciousness possess its own separate appropriate psychic or spiritual body for function upon supraphysical levels. The initiate of this high degree, therefore, will possess a twofold organization, his ordinary physical one, the companion of his former toils, and his supraphysical one, and will be able to utilize and function in each. He will have built the, his tower, his superstructure in the air. The superstructure must be perfect in all its structure parts and so be honorable to the builder. What are its parts? Man, even in his natural, unregenerate, imperfectly evolved state, is a highly composite creature. Blended with his purely physical frame are three other supraphysical but quasi-physical bodies, his etheric body, the double or wraith, his emotional or desire body, and his mental organization or body. Whilst over and beyond these, and not necessarily in functional alignment with them, exists his ultimate spiritual self, which distinguishes him from the subhuman creatures. These are his parts and they are but too often extremely ill-organized, uncoordinated, and unbalanced. If they be imperfectly organized in the lower natural man, how can they be expected to be able to contribute requisite sublimations of themselves for the upbuilding of a body upon a higher level? All bodily and mental disease and infirmity originates in disorder in these inner bodies, which disorder thereupon becomes reflected forwards and manifested in the physical husk. Unless the inner natures be disciplined and organized before the gross mortal vesture is shed at physical death, how can one enter the ethereal kingdoms otherwise than maimed, without a wedding garment, and in a distorted shape, not perfect in all its parts, and anything but honorable to the builder? But, as we have long since seen, the first duty of every spiritual craftsman is the purification and discipline of these bodies, and the elimination from himself of all base metals therein of which he has himself been an artificer. Only in proportion to the achievement of this arduous task can he hope to bring these parts into order, into subjection to his will, and into coordinated function and alignment, and so in the fullest sense stand erect, a just and upright man and mason. He need not trouble to know how his superstructure will develop or to what extent or measure of perfection he may have built it, for it will become automatically built in his heights, proportionately as he schools himself in his depths and tests his work by the continual application to it of the cross, which is the square, level, and plumb rule in combination. When the time comes for his consciousness to be raised to that superior level, and he hears the call, friend, come up higher, he will find the superstructure he has been building in the darkness below, perfect in all its parts and honorable to himself. He will have climbed a section of the life ladder. He will himself have built, dedicated, and consecrated King Solomon's temple. And through the result of his own labor upon himself, that resplendent body will appear to him more like the work of the great architect of the universe than that of human hands. There are, however, farther sections of the infinite ladder to be climbed, even when this high level has been won. From thence there remains still further building to be done, a body to be fabricated manifesting still loftier wisdom, strength and beauty. For was not the first symbolic temple to be destroyed and become replaced by a second, of which it is written that the glory of the former house is not to be compared with that of the latter? But this still loftier work need not now be treated of. Let it suffice if what has already been said assists any reader to the building of his first superstructural temple. 5. The Cable Toe these expositions are being offered in their present order with a purpose. That purpose is to outline, as nearly and systematically as may be, the due sequence and progressive stages of the work of spiritual craftsmanship or self-building. 
We have traced that work from its inception in the heart's desire to pass from darkness to light and attain a higher order of life and mode of being through its stages of the outer and inward purification essential to that attainment and through the crisis of a deeper gloom, a voluntary abnegation of and dying to all the attributes that go to constitute the natural personality until the aspirant who endures all these to the end is finally rewarded by receiving his crown of life as the biblical metaphor very fittingly terms that exalted order of conscious being which marks the fulfillment of human spiritual evolution. And we have shown how in winning that high degree of consciousness he has simultaneously built for himself out of the sublimations of his original nature a new superstructural body appropriate to it and in which it can function. In the abounding wealth of the symbols and veiled verbal references in our rituals and instruction lectures to the details of this truly scientific work, there remain, however, many others needing explanation, some of which can now be considered more advantageously than at our earlier stage and with better chance of being understood. One of these is the cable toe. In my previous book, it was explained that its use in the EA degree taught the beginner the useful lesson that he who has once felt within him the impulses of the central light and been moved to seek it should never recede from his quest and indeed cannot do so without doing violence to the highest within him, a violence equivalent to moral suicide. At the same time, he is also enjoined not to be unduly precipitate, not ignorantly and rashly to rush forward in an unprepared inward state to grasp the secrets of his own being, in which case peril of another kind threatens him, but to proceed humbly, meekly, cautiously, and under instructed guidance. The ancient maxim, know thyself, was coupled with another, nequid nimis, nothing in excess. For the science can only be learned and applied gradually. It will unfold itself more and more as it is diligently studied and pursued. The foregoing explanation of the cable toe is but a very partial one and inculcates a salutary but purely moral piece of advice. The deeper significance is a psychophysiological one and has to do with the mysteries of the human organism. It should not be overlooked that the cable toe is given prominence not only in the first degree, it is again mentioned in the obligation in the third degree, whilst it appears under another guise in that working tool of the master mason which acts upon a center pin. And finally, it reappears in the royal arch degree as a cord or lifeline. It is requisite to understand what is involved in something to which such recurring prominence is given. Let us first recall what has been already stated about the human organism being a composite structure of several natures or bodies, physical, etheric, emotional and mental, fixated in a unity or synthesis, each of such bodies being constituted of gross or subtle matter, of differing density and vibratory rate, and the whole coordinated by the central divine principle, which may or may not yet have come forward into the formal conscious mind although there are few in whose awareness it is not lurkingly present and more or less active as conscience. Thus, the human constitution may be likened to a number of glass tumblers placed one within the other, and with, say, a nightlight, representing the central principle, inserted in the inmost one. The glass of the tumblers may be imagined as of progressive thickness and coarseness from within outwards, and some of them as colored, dirty, or not closely fitting in with the others. The coarser, dirtier and more opaque the glasses, the less able will be the central light to shine through them. A single glass may be so opaque as to prevent the passage of the light through all the rest. Here then is an object lesson in the need for the inward purification of our various constituent sheaths and for becoming perfect in all our parts. As William Blake said very truly, if the gates of human perception were thoroughly cleansed, we should perceive everything as it is infinite. But man has closed himself up till he sees all things only through the narrow chinks of his own cavern. Another illustration. Human compositeness may be compared with the concentric skins or sheaths of a vegetable bulb, an onion or hyacinth. Here the sheaths are all equally pure and coordinated. And because the bulb is perfect in all its parts or sheaths and when planted fulfills the whole law of its nature, its life force bursts its natural bonds, throws up a self-built superstructure into the air, and there effloresces into the bloom which is its crown of life or fullness of development. Man should do this, and as we have shown, this is what the mason is taught to do. But man having what the bulb has not, 
freedom of will to fulfill or to violate, the law of his nature has chosen the latter course and consequently by indulgence in perverse desire and wrongly directed thought, has fouled and disorganized his sheaths, hence his spiritual darkness and his liability to all forms of disease. The central principle cannot shine through his opacity, lighting up his mind and governing his desires and actions. It remains imprisoned within him. He sees, thinks and knows only from his self-darkened outer sheaths and is misguided and eluded accordingly. For a final example, let us turn to the instructive familiar episode in the Gospels of the Storm, overtaking a boat containing a number of men of whom the chief was asleep in the hinder part of the boat. The boat typifies the human organism, its occupants, its various parts and faculties, including the as yet unawakened master principle resident in its depths or hinder part. An emotional upheaval occurs. The rough waves of passion threaten to wreck the whole party. A brainstorm arises. Intemperate gusts of fright, wrongheadedness and mental uncontrol make the position still worse. The extremity is sufficiently acute to awaken the master principle into activity whose beneficent power is able instantly to still those unruly winds and waves which suddenly are reduced to a great peace. Every master mason, who is a real and not merely a titular one, is able to perform this miracle in himself, perhaps in others also. There is nothing supernatural about it to him. It is possible to him because he has the mason word and second sight. He both understands the composite structure of the human organism, can visually discern the disordered part or parts, and can apply healing, harmonizing, vibratory power from his own corresponding part to the seat of mischief, saying to this disordered mental part or that unruly emotional sheath, peace be still. Every master mason is therefore also a master physician, able to benefit patients in a medical sense and also to visualize the inner condition of those who look to him for instruction and initiation in a Masonic sense to advise upon their interior needs and moral ailments and help them to purify and align their disordered natures. But this is not possible save to one who himself has become pure and rectified in all his parts. The physician must first heal himself before he can communicate either physical or moral health to others. This promise about the compositeness of the human structure and the existence in us of a series of independent yet coordinated parts or sheaths has been necessary before we can speak directly of the cable toe. What is it that connects these parts and are these parts dissociable from one another? We know that they are normally in close association and to this association applies the enjoinder that what God hath joined man shall not put asunder. What the age-long process of evolution has built up with infinite patience and care is not to be tampered with for improper purposes or even by well-meaning but as yet unenlightened experiment in the supposed interests of science. A point upon which the old masters and teachers of our science are specially insistent for reasons which now need not be entered upon. Nevertheless, a measure of dissociation does occur naturally in even the most healthy and well-organized people. And of cases of abnormal psychic looseness of constitution we need not speak. It occurs in sleep when the consciousness may be vividly active, whether in an orderly or disorderly manner. People travel in their sleep it occurs at times of illness or violent shock. It may be induced by alcohol or drugs. The anesthetic revelation is a well-recognized phenomenon. Under any of these conditions, there may be a complete ecstasis or conscious standing out or away of the ego from the physical body. Apparitions and even action at a distance are well-accredited facts. Such phenomena are explicable only upon the suppositions of the existence of a subtler vehicle than the gross body, of the fact that consciousness becomes temporarily transferred from the latter to the former, and that the two are capable of conjoint function in complete independence of the physical brain and body. What preserves the connection between the two parts, thus disjoined, and makes possible their subsequent recoalescence is the cable toe. It is a connective thread of matter of extreme tenuousness and elasticity issuing from the physical abdominal region and maintaining the same kind of connection with the extended subtle body as the string with which a boy flies a kite. As the boy can pull in the kite by the string, so does the extruded subtle body become drawn back to its physical base. Were the kite string severed during the kite's flight, the kite would collapse or be blown away. 
Similarly, with a human cable toe permanently severed, death would ensue and each of the severed parts go to its own place. Biblically, this human cable toe is called the silver cord in the well-known passage. Or ever the silver cord is loosed and the golden bowl is broken, then shall the body return to the earth and the spirit to God who gave it. Silver is the technical esoteric term for psychical substance, as gold is for spiritual and iron or brass for physical. Its physiological correspondence is the umbilical cord connecting the child with its mother. Its analogue in ecclesiastical vestments is the girdle worn by the high priests of the Hebrew and by the priests and monastics of the Christian church. Everyone unconsciously possesses the cable toe and it comes into use during sleep when a less or greater measure of involuntary dissociation of our parts occurs. A master, however, is one who has outgrown the incapacities to which the undeveloped average man is subject. Unlike the latter, he is in full knowledge and control of all his parts. Whether his physical body be awake or wrapped in sleep, he maintains unbroken consciousness. He is able at will to shut off consciousness of temporal affairs and apply it to supraphysical ones. He can thus function at a distance from his physical body, whether upon the mundane or upon higher planes of the cosmic ladder. His cable toe of infinite expansiveness unwinds from his center pin and stretching like the kite string enables him to travel where he will in his subtle body and to rejoin and reanimate his physical one at will. Hence it is that the Master Mason is pledged to answer and obey all signs and summonses from any Master Mason's lodge if within the reach of his cable toe. And such assemblies, it should be remembered, are contemplated therefore as taking place not at any physical location but upon an ethereal plane. For corroboration of what is possible in this respect to a master, one should reflect upon the instances of bilocation, passing through closed walls and manifesting at a distance, recorded of the great exemplar in the Gospels. These are representative of what is feasible to anyone attaining mastership. The cable toe, therefore, is given prominence to the reflective craftsman as a help towards understanding his own constitution and to foreshadow to him work that lies before him when is he fitted to undertake it, work which now may seem to him impossible and incredible. For as the spirit, which is the cable toe in another form, is intended for the skillful architect to draw forth a line to mark out the ground for the intended structure, so the competent builder of the spiritual body will unwind his own silver cord when he learns how to function consciously on the ascending ladder of supraphysical planes and to perceive the nature of the superstructure he himself is intended to construct. Further importance attaches to the significance of the cable toe from the fact testified to at the admission to our order of every new candidate for ceremonial initiation. For all real initiation involves the use of the actual silver cord or lifeline since such initiation always occurs when the physical body is in a state of trance or sleep and when the temporarily liberated consciousness has been transferred to a higher level. Thence it subsequently is brought back to the physical organism, the cerebral and nerve centers of which become illumined, revitalized and raised to a higher pitch of faculty than was previously possible. The perspicacious Royal Archmason will not fail to perceive how this truth is dramatically exemplified in that degree. This subject might be considerably extended, for whilst in a ceremonial system like the Masonic only one initiation is portrayed, or rather, where initiation only occurs once. Yet in the actual experience of soul architecture, initiation succeeds initiation upon increasingly higher levels of the ladder, as the individual becomes correspondingly ripe for them, able to bear their strain and to assimilate their revelations. What the craft teaching and symbols inculcate is a principle common to every degree of real initiation that one may prove worthy to attain. For each upward step, the candidate for the heights must be prepared as he is in the EA degree. At each, there will be the same peril in turning back, and at each, the same menace directed against rashly rushing forward. Six, the apron. So much was said in my former volume, The Meaning of Masonry, an explanation of the Masonic apron, that it seems needless to speak at length of it again. Yet to maintain continuity of thought, it seems desirable once more to refer to its symbolism at this point, since we have been closely considering the manner in which consciousness becomes expanded and enveloped in bodies or vehicles appropriate to that expansion. 
and we have been dealing with the arcanum or mystery propounded by St. Paul as to how the dead, the as yet uninitiated and spiritually unquickened, are raised up to a new order of life and the new kind of embodiment they take on or automatically fabricate in the process. Consciousness cannot exist without body. To every seed or conscious unit its own body, says the Apostle Initiate. Or as we Masons may paraphrase it, to every degree of life is allotted the appropriate apron proclaiming the wearer's spiritual rank. As no one can enter the lodge unclothed with the apron, so no one can enter any of the unseen worlds without wearing a body appropriate. There are bodies terrestrial adapted to use on the lower planes of life and bodies celestial or ethereal adapted to functioning on higher ones. Man is a composite of many bodies, one within the other, though ordinarily he is unaware of it and has not yet organized them and come to know them separately as the initiate is expected to do. The physical body is but one and the grossest of the terrestrial bodies. It is but a plaster of organized chemical particles within and around which his subtler bodies exist and for which it forms a nexus or fixation point. When totally discarded at death, it disintegrates. When partially abandoned in sleep or anesthesia, its energies persist passively, and connection with it is kept by the cable toe or silver cord. In each case, the ego, whether aware of it or not, stands minus its physical sheath and enclosed in its remaining ones. And a similar divesting of each successive body may take place until only the ultimate ego remains. That ego, the ultimate divine principle in man, is represented by the triangular flap of the Masonic apron. The triangle or pyramid form is the geometrical symbol for spirit or fire, and the ultimate spirit of man may be likened to a pointed flame or tongue of fire. The word pyramid derives from the Greek word pyr, fire. The body or form, or rather the succession of bodies or forms, which that ego assumes on descending into manifestation through the ladder, like planes of the universe, aggregating to itself and organizing around itself material from each is represented by the lower quadrangular part of the apron. The quadrangle square or superficies is the geometrical symbol for body form physicalization. The quadrangle is further appropriate because one, all body is constituted of four elements, earth, water, air, fire, two, because the human organism is fourfold, a complex of four distinct departments, physical, etheric, emotional, and mental, and three, because in man, the three subhuman kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal, are unified into the human synthesis. The candidate's first investiture with the apron is symbolic, therefore, of his ego's entrance into this world and becoming clothed with form or body. He's meant to realize himself as a sevenfold being perfectly constituted originally in the divine mirrored. His triangle of spirit combining with the quadrangle of materialized form to make up the perfect number seven. He is meant to realize that he has descended to a condition of embodiment and limitation of consciousness for the purpose of acquiring experience in those conditions and of performing certain work upon himself which shall raise him to full realization of his own ultimate nature and of the divine purpose in him and that though his present state or form is one of restrictedness and humiliation, it will never disgrace him if he never disgraces it. In the first degree, the triangular flap of the apron is kept erect. In the second, it is lowered. Thereby is denoted the physiological truth that the ego or human spirit on entering this world at birth does not immediately attain full embodiment, but at first is, as it were, an over-hovering presence, organically connected with the body, but only the gradually taking possession of it. We recognize this truth in practical life. Moral and legal responsibility is never attributed to a child under seven years of age, for the moral sense has not yet developed. Important physiological changes connected with puberty occur at the age of 14. Civic responsibility is denied until 21 is reached. The basic reason for all this is the occult truth that the ego does not attain its maximum of incarnation until 21. Accordingly, it is not until age is reached that a man is presumed competent to enter the craft and undertake the science of himself. As the ego immerses itself in its body and works upon it, it creates changes in it, whether for good or evil. It either organizes or disorganizes its vehicles according to its will and desires, it becomes an artificer in metals, whether base or precious. It either stores itself with ornaments and jewels and the invaluable furniture of self-knowledge, or with useless trumperies and grotesque contrivances of which sooner or later it must get rid. 
Assuming its activities to have been wisely directed, they are evidenced in the apron by the blue rosettes imposed upon it in the second degree. If they are persisted in, and the spirit more and more subjugates and controls the form, that increasing domination and the further progress made in the science are testified to by the additional elaborations found in the apron in the third degree. Still more advanced progress is evidenced by further changes and beautification of the apron in the royal arch degrees and in the grand lodges of provinces and of the nation. The tau displayed upon the apron worn by those of master rank is a form of the cross and also of the hammer of Thor of Scandinavian religion. It is displayed triply to signify that the wearer has brought his three lower natures, physical, emotional and mental, under complete control, that he has crucified them and keeps them repressed by the hammer of a strong will. The further important point should be noticed that the apron covers the creative, generative organ of the body, and it is especially to these that the significance of the Tao attaches. Spiritual self-building and the erection of the superstructure are dependent upon the supply of creative energy available from the generative nervous center, the powerhouse of the human organism. Thence that energy passes upwards through other ganglionic transformers and reaching the brain becomes finally sublimated and transformed to consciousness. Conservation of that energy is therefore indispensable both for generating consciousness and providing the material for the finer vehicle or superstructure in which that consciousness may function. The life energy is always creative, either in the direction of physical propagation or in that of superphysical upbuilding, hence the importance attached in religious spheres to celibacy. It should also be noted that in the three craft degrees, the investiture with the apron is made in the West and not by the master, but by his principal officer who is deputed to bestow it. The meaning behind this important detail is that while the human ego is resident in this temporal world, the West, nature, as the chief officer and deputy of providence, supplies it with bodies of her own material and temporal substance. But in all cases beyond those three, the investiture takes place in the East, the realm of spirit, and from the hands of the master himself. For the progressed soul receives a clothing beyond nature's power to supply, and without intermediate hands, God giveth it a body as it pleaseth him, and to every such soul its own body according to its measure of progress and consciousness. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.